Hello and welcome to In The Know, I'm Helen Raptus. And I'm Chad Young. Thanks for joining us. We have a special edition of our show for you. It's a look back at the highlights of the 2010-2011 school year. We'll start all the way back in September on the first day of school. A sea of children, parents and teachers gathered outside Washington Elementary. Washington doesn't use buses, so children line up outside school before the bell, waiting to walk into their classrooms. After seven years at Houck Elementary, it was Principal Sean McMillan's first year at Washington. You know, it's definitely a challenge when you're coming in new and, and you don't really know how, thing, how things work, but that's an advantage for me in terms of how also I'm communicating with kids is, hey, I'm new too. And we got a lot of kids that are new, so I can um, help support them a little bit that way too and kind of share their experience a little bit. It was a similar scene over at Vancouver's School of Arts and Academics, where a mix of middle and high schoolers wandered in to find their schedules. Good morning. How are you? Awesome. The first day was a busy one for Superintendent Steve Webb. He bounced from building to building, helping ring in the new school year. Dr. Webb, along with other school district leaders, shook hands with staff and greeted children. To make sure the school year got off to a good start, the Vancouver Fire Department brought trucks to several schools stuffed to the gills with school supplies. The community donated more than $10,000 in supplies and cash. The response from the community has just been incredible. Every day people are coming to the fire station dropping stuff off and the, uh, it's just been fantastic. So. And it wasn't just pencils and pens. Supplies included shoes, clothing, and personal hygiene products, so students were ready to learn when they got to class. Firefighters weren't the only ones making donations. Longtime volunteers at Fruit Valley Elementary, Irwin and Dovey Landerholm, orchestrated a school supply drive. Thanks to their efforts and donations from Irwin's law colleagues, 30 children received backpacks filled with everything they needed to do their schoolwork. At King Elementary, donations came in from home improvement store Lowe's. Keith Wells, a parent at King, wrote a grant. And because of that, the school's Family Community Resource Center got a complete remodel. One of the school year's signature events was the We Learn Technology Expo in October. Held at Hudson's Bay High School, this was the first time for the expo. More than 40 booths manned by students and teachers showed off how technology is being used in the classroom. The idea was to give parents and the community a chance to get their hands on the same tools teachers use every day to improve learning. And those who gave it a try came away impressed. I'm really surprised by the amount of Apple technology and uh, personal use technology that they're involving and making it a very one-on-one -on -one experience for the students. This is just hot. I, I would like this at home. <laughs> extent that they're using technology throughout the district at all the different grade levels because I think when you have a student in one grade you may not be aware of how extensive it is. Um, you only see a very small piece of what your student is getting and not realizing the breadth of what's out there. With one successful event under their belts, school administrators are planning to make this an annual event. The next We Learn Expo is set for this October, so mark it on your calendar. Technology, science, and math are all major priorities for the school district. We saw all of those at Skyview's Science, Math, and Technology Challenge Day. But as Elena Bowler reports, there was a little bit of slapstick comedy, too. The theme was airplane. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. It may sound funny, but the challenge was nothing to laugh at. Teacher Nate Macon explains. So the challenge was is to build an object that can fly from the second story um, of Skyview High School. We have a nice commons area. And it flies from the second story and drop an object from um, that device onto a target that's about five feet in diameter in the middle of the commons. Each group was given a set of supplies to build their aircraft. Then students got down to work. We wind the propeller like that, like by, just by spinning it. And there's three rubber bands throughout here connect to this. So when you let go, it propels. <laughs> now, if you're thinking success sounds impossible, you're not alone. I, I think I'm very worried. I, I don't think, uh, I think very few, few, uh, few people are going to succeed. We took a look for ourselves. The table marks the spot in the middle of the room. The whole point of the competition is to get the planes to pass over that and drop their payload. The kicker is they've got to do it from all the way up here. Not an easy feat, but completing the task wasn't the only way to earn points. One major component, working together. So with a group you get like multiple perspectives and different ideas and just working off of each other. 
Another way to get a good grade, make a parent or teacher laugh. It's good to interject a little bit of um, fun in it as well. Absolutely. I mean, if they're going to spend the whole day here and do, you know, work on a project, it should be fun. All kidding aside, this is still a competition, and as evidence behind me, a lot of these kids are serious about hitting their target and winning. Soon, it was go time. Students lined up on the second story and sent their creations flying. Kind of. Crash after crash, we were beginning to wonder if it was indeed an impossible task to complete. When one plane actually made it over the table and then managed to drop its payload. Okay, let's see it one more time in slow motion. We've highlighted the plane and you can see as it flies over the table, it actually drops the marker onto the target. Did you ever think that you were going to get both? I mean, no, I honestly did not. Sam Pritchard and his team were the only ones who managed to hit the mark. Holy cow, actually landing it. That was beautiful. Well done. But at the awards ceremony, several were singled out for their hard work. My whole point is that, that problem solving is fun, no matter what the problem is. Even if the problem is, is way too difficult. Four in the know. I'm Elena Buller. This isn't the only fun project spearheaded by Mr. Macon this year. He set up a giant game of battleship in the school's commons using tables as a barrier. Once Mr. Macon gave them some basic math formulas, it was up to the students. Teams had to build machines that could fling a marble over the tables and accurately hit their opponent's ships. In their next project, they stopped competing against each other and started collaborating. The class project was to build a giant Rube Goldberg machine. You may remember those from the game Mousetrap. Each team had to build a machine which would link up to its neighbor to create a seamless transition, starting with the push of a button and ending with the raising of a flag. Students at Geyser Middle School got out of the classroom and into a living laboratory. The National Science Foundation awarded Geyser a grant that paid for a Washington State University graduate student to come out and assist in a science project. Sixth and seventh graders tested the water in a drainage pool behind the school. They looked for chemicals in the water by studying different kinds of bugs. The ones that are high pollution tolerant, they can, if there's a lot of those, then we can tell that there's been a lot of pollution in our school from all the garbage on the ground. And if there's a lot of low pollution, then that means that our school has been like very helpful in picking up the garbage. Students tell us that by getting out into the field to see how our ecosystem works, it teaches them more than they could ever learn from a textbook alone. Over at Jason Lee Middle School, students get a different kind of science lesson as a mobile science lab rolls onto campus. Yeah. Sponsored by Seattle Children's Hospital, the Science Adventure Lab is basically a tricked out RV. The doctors and scientists on board travel all over Washington, sharing a research project with students. When we stopped by, students in Mrs. Womack's class were swabbing their cheeks for DNA. Columbia River tries to do its part for the environment with a new solar panel. This ribbon-cutting ceremony is the end of a long process. Student leaders wrote grant applications to get funding for the panel, and different clubs pitched in to help out. The school's principal tells us this effort really brought the school together. In just the first few months it was installed, the solar panel saved 325 pounds of CO2. At Vancouver School of Arts and Academics, they installed a different kind of panel on their building. This one helps preserve the history of Vancouver. Workers put up one of six planned mosaic panels on the front of the building. This has been six years in the making. It's part of the Confluence Project, a region-wide art project celebrating how the Columbia River has brought people together throughout history. We've seen a number of news stories this year about the devastating consequences of bullying. Students at two Vancouver middle schools took a stand against it. They completely just pushed me. At Alki, kids in Mrs. Harris's theater class saw reports of teen suicides and decided to produce a multimedia play for their classmates. The students used strong language with an even stronger message. Before this, I used to, you know, it was a, no big of a deal, you know, throw out a couple things like that, but now that I understand what the meaning of the words and stuff and how it affects people and the videos we watched in class that showed how it does, then now I'm like, you know, that's really bad. I should 
never should have done that. I'm really disappointed. Um, I hope people get, you know, the courage to stand up to bullies throughout the school and whenever they, throughout their whole life, you know. The students who put on the performance wrote poems, created artwork, and scripted a drama, all based on things they'd seen in the halls of their own school. At Geyser, the anti-bullying message was delivered in the form of Rachel's Challenge, a national movement inspired by the shootings at Columbine High School. The program challenges students to empathize with one another. We see it more of an awareness of uh, the power of the way they treat each other, especially the power of the words they use to one another. Um, kids become more aware uh, of that. I used to pick on other kids, and since the first assembly way out, I've stopped. So, And it'll help me just be friendlier to everyone and like say hello to people I don't know and try to introduce myself and stuff. Rachel's challenge was started by the family of Rachel Scott, one of the victims at Columbine. It takes seven years of college to become a lawyer, and then you still have to pass the bar exam. But some local high schoolers are getting the next best thing. Please be seated. At first glance, it looks like a scene out of law and order. Earnest lawyers arguing a murder case in front of a judge in a courtroom. Nothing seems amiss until you get a closer look at the attorneys. You have to know objections. I mean, things that normal attorneys would learn in law school, and we have to learn it uh, in high school. <laughs> Patrick Crawford is a senior at Fort Vancouver High School and one of the lead attorneys on its mock trial team as it competes in the district finals. The program that Fort Vancouver has built uh, has really prepared the kids. Coach Sean O'Malley is also the school's drama teacher, which comes in handy. Teams are given a case packet with the evidence and characters laid out. It's almost like a script for uh, a play or a drama club. Some of the team members serve as lawyers and must put together the case. Others play witnesses. We do auditions for witnesses to kind of match your own personality with that witness's personality, because later on in the trial you have to become that person and bring them to life. After months of preparation, the team presents its case in front of a real judge at the Clark County Courthouse. And it runs exactly like a normal court case. Instead of a jury of peers, the teams must impress a panel of real attorneys who score them on their arguments, objections, and motions. It's, I like to compare it to a sport, but uh, unlike a sport where you're physically uh, demanding on your body, it's mentally demanding. And it Thanks to that mental preparation, Fort finished second in districts and headed up to Olympia for its 20th consecutive state competition. Students are also seeing benefits outside the courtroom. Uh, public speaking is huge. I've gotten so, more so much more confidence just being able to stand up in front of my class. And I believe we would move into uh, opening statements. It's a big win for the Vancouver School Board, as it's named the 2010 Board of the Year. The honor was bestowed by the Washington State School Directors Association. The district's application highlighted several initiatives. They included expanding program choices for students, paying special attention to high-needs schools, offering grants to encourage innovation, and using performance management tools. Vancouver Public Schools are the best in North America when it comes to communication. The district won the prestigious Leadership Through Communications Award. The honor is handed out annually by Blackboard Connect, the National School Public Relations Association, and the American Association of School Administrators. The judging committee praised Vancouver Public Schools for using every tool possible to reach committee members and for making communication a two-way street. Vancouver Public Schools get a rare honor, an invitation to speak to lawmakers in Olympia about their innovative Family Community Resource Centers. VPS was one of four districts from around the state to talk about how they help families in lower income areas. Representatives described the district's long and short-term goals for improving student performance and the specific programs in place to reach them. We want to thank our friends at TVW for providing us with this video. A number of Vancouver Public School students earned awards this year. At Columbia River High School, senior Rebecca Leong won a national scholarship contest and a $50,000 scholarship. Her winning research project followed runners who go with and without shoes to determine which group suffered more injuries. She determined that they're about the same, contradicting a common theory that barefoot running is better for your feet. Rebecca was one of two finalists who got to go to Washington, D.C. to accept their prizes. Skyview senior Clint Saylor was also the winner in a national contest. His demo reel of camera shots earned him one of five spots in the All-American video crew. In January, he was flown to San Antonio, Texas to work on a webcast of the U.S. Army All-American Bowl game. The sponsor of the contest, 
New Tech was impressed with its winners. And apparently they kind of got blown away by us, like, because they, the day that they were training us how to use all their equipment, they planned it out for like a six hour day and we finished it in like three or four hours. And after that, they were like, you know, what are we supposed to do with you guys? <laughs> In addition to helping with the football game, Clint shadowed an MTV crew as it picked up video footage. He said it was great to see professionals at work, and he really enjoyed meeting the other All-Americans. Clint wasn't the only video production student to earn acclaim this year. Students from VSAA and Fort Vancouver had their films accepted into the Youth Silent Film Festival held at the Hollywood Theatre in Portland. Two students, Isaac Chamberlain and Zach York, both from VSAA, were among the four finalists. Isaac's film took third place and Zach's won the Audience Award. Another VSAA student, Nick Shaw, didn't win at the Film Fest, but ended up winning one of the biggest prizes in television. His film, The Muffin Man, won a regional Emmy. I think it's absolutely amazing to be recognized as like one of the best student filmmakers in the Northwest. Nick's movie also won him a large college scholarship to George Fox University. We featured Nick and his crew in an episode of the Young Filmmakers Project earlier this year. Vancouver public school students gave back to their community this year. One of the best examples was VSAA's annual Day of Caring. The entire school fanned out over Vancouver to volunteer at a number of different projects. Some stayed on campus to beautify the grounds. One group headed down to Esther Short Park in downtown to clean up trash. I think it's important to all of us because we all live so close to this area that to see it clean is just, it makes a difference for us on a daily basis. Some students spent the day with seniors and others with kids. Late in the afternoon, everyone headed back to school for a celebration concert. At Hudson's Bay, a student worked to make sure every student could have a good time at prom. To help students who couldn't afford a prom dress, Christina Chen organized a dress drive. Community members dropped off their gowns, purses, and shoes. And then some of them are from parents and students and just, and uh, this one guy was so sweet. He brought his late wife's, or late daughter's prom dress and I was like, oh. The National Honor Society and Key Club helped Christina with the drive along with a number of volunteers. At the end, in a special event, girls from all over the school district stopped by to pick out an outfit for the big dance. Columbia River horticulture students partnered up with the Clark County Food Bank to feed the hungry. The food bank won a grant and asked River to help plant fresh vegetables at Washington State University's Heritage Farm. It's a great experience for the students. They learn stuff that I don't think that they can learn in a classroom. This hands-on experience is just really, it will change their lives, I hope. So also just giving back to the community. That's what, you know, we all strive to do, but this is really going to feed Vancouver. The students planted pumpkins and three types of squash. They won't be ready for harvest until school resumes in the fall, so many of these students will have a chance to see the fruits of their labor. Schools across the district raised money in the annual chess drive. They brought in coins from home, which are then donated to the Vancouver School District Foundation. The foundation has a number of programs to help families in need, among them the emergency checkbook, which lets principals quickly meet the needs of students. The Chess Drive is a district-wide event and happens every fall. It's pretty hot. Hot pink, my favorite. All right. Mr. Tusink's class at Walnut Grove Elementary raised more than $100 in the first days of the Chess Drive, earning the right to dye the associate principal's hair. As you can see, they chose bright pink. The associate principal, Travis Bond, wore his hair that way all day. As a school, Walnut Grove pulled together $1,600. The Vancouver School District Foundation awards grants to staff members for creative ideas to help kids. And they surprise this year's recipients with oversized checks, Ed McMahon style. The money pays for programs to engage students in their learning. Oftentimes, these programs would go unfunded. Over three days, the foundation handed out about 65 checks worth more than $80,000. One of those grants paid for a guest instructor from the Oregon Ballet Theater at Alki Middle School. Hannah Downs spent a week in Miss Machos' class teaching the students classic ballet techniques mixed with modern moves. This is the first year dance has been offered at Alki after more than a decade without it. As part of that VSD Foundation grant, Miss Machos also had a hip-hop dance instructor come in. The football coach at Geyser Middle School is a lot like other people involved in youth athletics. Coach Long loves football, 
watches ESPN, and works hard to improve players. But there's something about Coach Long you'll notice right away. There is one thing that separates the Geyser Middle School football team from almost every other team in the nation. The head football coach is a woman. Uh, I think she, uh, since she has some experience uh, with a, another women's football team, uh, I think she's a great coach. Uh, she, she knows a lot about fundamentals and a lot. But it's going to be Herrera. Coach Shannon Long has nine years of coaching experience with the last two as head coach. She has a passion for the game and her players are taking notice. Yeah, well, like, she's not too intense to where, like, the kids start crying kind of thing. But she's, like, she's intense to where they'll listen to her and she'll, they'll, they'll know she's boss. When Coach Long steps onto the field, it's not about being a woman. It's about being a coach. And it's something her players will tell you she does very well. I'm a teacher here, so they all know me. And they've had me since they were sixth graders. So I don't think that they look at me as, you know, a woman being a, a football coach. They just see me as, as a coach and hopefully they respect that. I think they do respect that. In an age where young women were discouraged from the hard knocks of the gridiron, Coach Long played whenever she had the opportunity. I played powder puff football and as a junior and senior in high school because girls playing football wasn't, wasn't an option that was pretty taboo. Coach Long has a keen attention to detail and believes the path to success starts with the basics. Fundamentally, we're getting there. My most important thing is that nobody gets hurt. And if we're fundamentally sound, then people getting hurt shouldn't happen. But hopefully they can grow from this and have fun. Coach Long isn't the only trailblazing female at Geyser. A record seven girls came out for the wrestling team this year, competing against boys. They were an asset to the team, winning matches regularly. And competing has had a positive effect on the girls too. Yeah, definitely it's helped her self-confidence and it's helped her schoolwork because she has to have certain grades to be on wrestling. So I, uh, I think it's good all around. Yeah. Even though some guys have expressed concerns about wrestling girls, it all melts away when the match begins. Some of the girls plan to continue their wrestling careers in high school. Two Vancouver high school teams got it done athletically and academically this spring. The boys tennis team at Skyview High School and the girls golf team at Columbia River both won academic state titles. The guys carried a 3.84 GPA, one point below the ladies at 3.85. Skyview's dance team, the Rain, lived up to its name, winning its second state championship in the last three years. This is home video of the team performing the winning routine at the state championships in Yakima. The team practiced about three hours a day, plus weekend performances. With that much preparation, the dancers were ready for the big stage. I thought that we would win. I had that, you know, that thought in the back of my mind, but I didn't want to, you know, get too excited and I didn't want to tell them because, you know, you get that gut feeling like we've really got something special. I kind of had like a relay moment where I wasn't really sure if they really called our name or not. So then when it like processed in my mind, it was just like pure bliss and I couldn't believe that all the hard work paid off. The entire performance at Yakima is available on our YouTube page. It was an exciting year for Fort Vancouver's broadcast team. For the first time ever, they broadcast boys and girls basketball games live on Comcast. In the past, games had been replayed after the fact, but never been live. After a successful winter season, they hope to go live with football and either soccer or volleyball in the fall. One of our proudest moments this year was our broadcast of the Patty Houck Parade. The annual event winds down Main Street in Vancouver's Uptown Village. Nick Vole shows us all the action. Call it the luck of the Irish. On a soggy St. Paddy's Day, the rain stops just long enough for a parade. It never rains on the parade. For Barbara Hammond, the parade's organizer, there's no time to worry about the weather when there's a storm of activity behind the scenes. Just lots of phone calls and confirmations and things like that and last minute changes all the way to the end. Starting at Hauk Elementary and winding its way down Main Street, the parade rolls out. Police cars, bagpipers, local politicians, Hauk neighborhood community businesses, even a couple of marching bands all delight the crowd. Oh, it's been great. We come every year and we just have a great time. One real eye catcher is the Patty Houck float, a giant replica of Vancouver's famous one-armed educator. And Patty has a new suit and he talks and he waves. Mixed in are Houck Elementary students presenting their class themes to a panel of judges. There are plenty of categories and plenty of opportunities to impress the judges. 
it is incredibly hard because they are all so adorable. But I, I would say we're looking for enthusiasm, for teamwork, creativity. And if you're looking for smiling faces, well, they're on display too. The kids are returning back to class after having walked in the parade, but their day of fun isn't over just yet. After this, they're going to head into the gymnasium where the judges are going to hand out their awards. So all in all, a really fun day for the kids and a great way for the Howe community to come together. For In the Know, I'm Nick Vole. The annual culture parade is always a highlight. It brings out third grade classes from around the district to march around the historic Fort Vancouver grounds. Students display either their own cultural heritage or that of a group they studied in class. Joining us now is the district's television production supervisor, Nick Vole. Thanks, Chad. I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to all the volunteers who helped make this a great year. Our department has only two employees, myself and the guy behind the camera. In order to make In the Know and all the other shows we produce, we need a lot of help. In just a few moments, we're going to put up a list of the volunteers who have given their time and talent this year. Please read it, and if you see any of these people, let them know you appreciate it. And I especially want to thank Chad and Helen for volunteering all their time and energy this year to make our show what it, what it was, so I appreciate that. It's really been fun. Thank you, Nick. And thank you at home for watching. We'll see you next time on In the Know.